Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there are still two speakers missing. So if, uh, if they won't come, we have a lot of time, a lot of time for the speakers that are here and a lot of time for discussion. Uh, and we still have a lot of time to start. Um, but I don't know. I haven't heard of them uh, if they come. So welcome this morning. My name is Dirk Hinterlang. I come from Germany. North Rhine-Westphalia is the state where I work in. And I work there for the State Agency for Nature Conservation and Environment and Consumer Protection. And uh, I'm in the domain of uh, nature conservation, so I know quite a lot about uh, this. And um, just in short, I was a facilitator of, uh, of a big uh, thematic working group in the INSPARC process uh, that was biogeographic regions and uh, habitats and uh, uh, biotopes and species distribution and I was a member of protected sites so I have uh, quite a lot of knowledge I guess uh, about uh, the data models and things that happened afterwards. Oh there is Dean right? Is that Dean? Welcome. So we have a fourth speaker. Um, Please make sure that your presentation is, uh, you give her presentation, your presentation to her so she can put it on the computer. And we have a nice little program, uh, and those are the important persons this morning. Um, uh, we start with uh, Marco Hohmann, uh, who is sitting there uh, from the German Environment Agency. And then uh, we have another agency, that's the European um, Environmental Agency, uh, Christian Ansorge, he is uh, with us already. And then we s I saw uh, Dean Hintz uh, from, from Safe Software, and uh, he will have the third uh, presentation. And then Miko Wiesa from the Finnish Meteorological Institute, he's already there. There he is, yes. And um, hopefully we will have the fifth uh, presentation then. Um, by Christian Aden, University of Oldenburg, again a German, so this is pretty, pretty many Germans here today. Um, so, no longer talk from me. So the floor is open for you, Marco Hohmann. Okay, thank you very much. The right presentation. So much presentations. <laughs> yeah, that's. Oh, <laughs> what's this? Could you please Can anybody help, help me? Because there's something. Yeah, just close it. I think. Okay, good morning ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like to present you a project for the implementation uh, of sensor observation service and download app for air quality data. My name is Marco Hohmann from the uh, German Environment Agency um, in Berlin uh, in the section of environmental information systems and services. To my background, um, um, a colleague and I, we operate and manage the spatial data infrastructure of the agency and we are also responsible for the coordination and implementation um, of the INSPIRE reporting in the agency. By my side is um, Thor Fechner from the Conterra um, company in Münster, Germany. Um, Thor is involved in this project with consulting as well as um, as the technical development and implementation of the sense observation service and the download app. Yeah. What you can expect in the next 15 minutes is, um, first of all, we begin with a very uh, briefly uh, introduction on the air quality data and UBA's spatial data infrastructure. Um, after this, we'll, we'll have a look on the uh, on the processes, at the processes in the background uh, before we come to a live presentation 
uh, a live demo. And finally, we will conclude. Uh, I will conclude with a summary um, and a look into the near future. So let's start. A uh, few words um, on the agency. Since the foundation of the agency, the publication, publication, uh, public relations and policy uh, advice have been essential tasks. In recent years, another task, the provision of environmental data has become increasingly important. This is also true for the air quality data. Different laws and uh, legislation, uh, regulations, such as the air quality directive, inspire directive, or national uh, data, open data strategy, um, set requirements for environmental, for environmental data. In Germany, as a federally structured country, air quality data are upload um, comes from uh, from measure, measuring networks of 16 federal states. Um, the data from these measurement uh, networks are upload in a central database in the, in in the um, Uber and then transformed into the air quality data schema. The result are different um, data streams. The data streams uh, uh, E1A and E2A are in focus on uh, in this project. E1A data stream represents validated data um, updated mostly uh, monthly, uh, and the E2A data uh, stream represents uh, the unvalidated data uh, approximately um, hourly means up to date uh, data. So all the uh, air quality data streams are uh, published on the uh, spatial data infrastructure of Uber. Yeah, and this slide we illustrates this infrastructure. It's a typical uh, three-tier architecture um, with the data storage on bottom level, server and service level in the middle, and the client and application level on top. Uh, for this project, we uh, the infrastructure has been extended um, by, by a sensor observation client um, and has um, corresponding um, database schema. And um, in addition, the, the FME, FME server um, functionality um, has been added to an existing uh, map client. So based on this infrastructure, um, processes have been implemented on the FME server. Um, um, that you can see on the next slide. Yeah. The graphic presentation is readable from left to right. Um, starting point is the database where the um, federal states upload their um, air quality data in a um, Yeah, from here in a pre-process, um, these measurements will be um, transformed into the air quality data schema that also considers the INSPIRE requirements. Aim of this sub-process is uh, to build XML files um, for the different data streams. But uh, this pre-process is currently is not part of the uh, of this project. Um, it's planned. Uh, for the future to integrate uh, this process into the, um, uh, uh, managed by um, FM, FME. Yeah, the XML files are the base yeah, for different processes. Two processes are um, implemented in a, in a former uh, project in 2015 for, um, for Inspire View Service and uh, inspire download service based on the atom standard um, the first um, process that was implemented in this project is 
as, as this project in uh, a purple outlined. Um, this process is for transformation of XML files into the um, sensor observation schema and and for the import of the measurements and the associated metadata into the database. From this point, um, data are available on sensor observation service um, API. The second process here, a uh, green outlined, um, serves the data of air quality data, um, uh, serves the download of air quality data after a user-based selection um, of data via the download app. How it works, uh, we will see in, in the live demo. We, uh, before we come to the live demo, um, some examples um, for the um, SOS API. Um, in the first example, you can see a request on all uh, stations uh, that are available um, via the SOS, or in the second example, um, um, a specific station uh, requested by its um, ID, and so on. But um, I think it works fine for machine-to-machine -machine interaction, um, but um, it's not a good solution for users uh, without a technical um, background. Therefore, uh, we have created um, uh, therefore, in addition to the sensor observation service and automation, uh, it was part of this project to create a graphical user interface for visualization and download of the air quality data. Yeah, I will go change to a browser. Okay. Yeah, the app starts with a short introduction. I load it again. Yeah, the app starts with a short in introduction that explains the most uh, important functionalities. Um, yeah, but yeah, the step was not necessary. <laughs> That's not Oh, okay. It's the worst case. <laughs> okay. No connection. Okay, I fall back to the um Okay, that's the result, so okay. That is what we want to see. Yeah, also, in the first step, you can visualize um, the data to get an overview um, of measurements. You can you can choose uh, you can choose one of the um, one one of the air pollutants. Uh, sorry, the um, download app currently is only available in German uh, and. Uh, can see which measure, uh, which air pollutant is uh, available on a, uh, on a sampling point. You can you can zoom in to a specific uh, um, sampling point and and can see so more information. Um, for example, to uh, how um, values change over the time. Next step, we can uh, we can change to the download uh, wizard. Um, this is a four-step wizard um, for the download of air quality data. In first step, you choose an um, air pollutant again. Next step, um, um, you have. I have three, three options to select um, measurement points, um, sampling points. You can, the first option is to select a um, specific measurement point by his name, 
or in the second option is second option is to um, select all um, sampling points into um, in a of a federal state, or in a third option is to um, um, select the um, to select the sampling points directly into the map in the map. In the first step, you can choose a user can choose a, a time time period uh, from today till the uh, entire uh, available uh, time period. And in the third step, fourth step, you can choose a time format and uh, finish your uh, download by entering an uh, email address. So the, and the download link will be sent to this email address. This step is necessary uh, because the compilation of the data can take some time, um, several minutes or longer, depending on the data selection or the so, uh, and the server load. So this is the result, an email with, uh, with the download link and some information about your selection. Um, Yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the presentation and thank you for keeping your time, um, even a few minutes less than that. Are there any questions about this presentation? And uh, sorry that the internet is not working. It would have been much nicer if you could have shown it. Mm -hmm. Of course, live on the internet, What was the, uh, that was the idea. There is a question. There. Okay. Uh, Good morning. I'm Carlo Cipolloni from the Italian Environmental Agency, so more or less we have the same uh, problem, same approach. <laughs> uh, I want to know if you manage directly all the database of, uh, of uh, SOS uh, Mitchell, or you in some way manage the, the, the federate state that uh, have most probably most of the, 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 the station of uh, measurement. And if you manage it in the central database, uh, which is the, the volume of data that you have to, to manage? Oh, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, as well, uh, yeah, I'm for, uh, responsible for the, um, for the coordination. Uh, the, the, the data upload is managed by a colleague of mine. But in my opinion, uh, the the federal states um, upload uh, uh, reporting data um, to a central uh, database um, in the agency only, yeah. Do you have an idea of a volume that you have to manage? How many gigabytes? Oh. Yeah, many gigabytes. It's, it's sure. Yeah, it's, it's vector data. Yeah, no, because we but have a gigabyte. Yeah. Either the, the E1A and E2A data streams are. It's Two to three gigabytes, yeah. four. Okay. Okay. Um, there is another question there. Good morning. Dean from the Mass from the Dutch Environmental Agency. Mm -hmm. um, to change your system to the Inspire uh, data model and uh, the European system to receive that, do you have any idea what estimated cost or how much time it took you? Sorry, can you uh, repeat it? Okay, to change your your system yeah. from uh, the old way to the Inspire as well as way you uh, uh, had to give a lot of I think uh, it took you a lot of effort. Do you have any estimation of the effort it took you? Um, I <coughs> estimate. Don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, 
sorry. I could, I could, I could, I could übersetzen. Also, wie viel Aufwand war das, das System an die, uh, an die Inspire-Richtlinie anzupassen? Yeah. Vielleicht in Personentagen oder? A rough estimation. Um, yeah, we used the, um, <laughs> the, um, uh, the database schema uh, sensor observation source and uh, air quality uh, data schema is also in, uh, implemented in, in this uh, yeah, in this schema but uh, so the, the 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 effort for us was uh, for, sorry <laughs> I will come to, be, to you back later. Yeah, right. okay, we can just afterwards, so, yeah. It's Sorry. It's a project, it takes uh, around about um, nine months and has several steps. The first step was the uh, data transformation from the original air quality data structure into the SOS database. Hmm. This was one step. And uh, the second step was uh, the implementation of the, of the app. We can't see live. And uh, I think the effort was around about uh, for us um, 60 days. Uh, and the most of the efforts is um, the usability of the air quality data app and not the data transformation because we used uh, out of the box the sensor observation service from 5 to N for that and based on map apps or technology we can use and so we have to customize it and uh, but the most effort uh, goes to the um, um, uh, to the usability of the of the of the internet app for the users. Okay. Yeah, thank you very thank much. You. Mm. So, if there is no further question pressing, then uh, I would uh, ask the next speaker. Sorry. That's yeah. Christian. Dirk. Christian Ansorge. Dirk. Excuse uh, me. Oh, yeah. there is a question I have, there. I have one question to the yeah. German colleagues, uh, Hugo. Um, we, we know that also in Belgium, if Shell is using and setting up the SOS services and has an interaction, do you actually collect data or use air quality data from the neighboring countries? Netherlands no. Well. In the Netherlands as well. Not yet. No. Only the provision of the SOS. But you can ask it. Uh, sorry, I didn't get any tell of uh, all the part of the question. So, yes, uh, in Belgium there is an SOS server set up, and the Netherlands, RLDM is also operating one. Oh, sorry. So yes, there's a server set up in uh, Belgium by uh, Arcel Celine, uh, one in uh, the Netherlands by uh, RIVM. And now we have also this one in Germany. There are also other states in Europe, uh, UK does it, uh, Sweden, uh, Lithuania, all these have systems like this running. Uh, the way they are loading the data depends totally on the country. So there are very different strategies used for uh, loading the data. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you are Germany is already using the data cross-border, uh, but um, I know from Belgium uh, they are highly interested in consuming the data in real time from the neighboring countries to do some work on top of this. So, for example, they are connecting to SOS servers uh, from R, uh, deriving some t uh, statistics and doing some um, yeah, further analysis and have this added value of the cross-border availability of data. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I'm afraid I have to stop the discussion now here because uh, otherwise we will run out of time. So this is the moment when I ask Christian um, Ansorge to give his presentation um, on reusing Inspire for environmental reporting. Uh, those of you who have been over the, here over the past few days had, uh, I think, two or three chances to hear a little bit uh, about this. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So do you have a problem? Yeah. So we have first to connect the, the Wi Fi mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah, so but Okay. 
but in the meantime, I can already start, <laughs> as I know the slides. Uh, yeah, thanks for the first presentation. Actually, the, the chronology of those two presentations should have been the, just reversed, because uh, the first presentation was about the national implementation, and now comes uh, the presentation about that, what logically uh, comes in the first place. This is the design of a data flow. So, um, my name is Christian Ansorger. I work for the, environment uh, for the European Environment Agency, and uh, the presentation uh, I am going to give well, maybe. Um, I can do it without slides, but it's a bit boring, maybe. Uh, some of you might have seen that already, uh, at least part of those slides, uh, in the workshop we had on Monday, uh, where I saw some of the, some of the faces I recognize here. Um, the goal of the presentation, the scope of the presentation, is to have a short look on the, on, the, on the objective of reporting, where we are starting right now, what is the challenge we face as EA. So it's a little bit particular uh, as it comes to Inspire. Um, to introduce uh, that what we call the linked approach as an as a approach for extending uh, data models and uh, then to close uh, to show how this linked approach is implemented in CDDA. So now, well, it would be good if I would have slides because there's an image where I would like to refer to. Um, could it be that the presentation? Well, I know you don't like it, but I have a USB stick. I don't know you don't like the USB sticks, but I have it on a USB ah, stick. Okay, uh, okay. We okay. can make an yeah. exception. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and please don't, uh, don't take that off my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is Christian Aden in the room? Okay, then we have the time. <laughs> Um, this is a IT conference, right? <laughs> uh, okay. Oh. Yes, yes, and I had many presentations. So here we are. Oh, well, it would be fantastic if that now would work. Fantastic. I am not starting again. First slide. So this is a, uh, this is a picture. Um, I will speed up a little bit. Um, what I uh, where I wanted to start is to show you a little bit the uh, situation where we start from. So uh, the EA is operating a large number of data flows, about 100. So with data flows, we mean basically the uh, submission of data uh, from member states to the EA, uh, following a reporting obligation or following a bilateral agreement here you see that the number uh, of data flows is really increasing so uh, there is a little bit uh, a bi uh, biannual uh, bias in there due to water framework directive I think so we receive a large number of that uh, and there we need to operate uh, automatic services so this is a little bit to give you a picture how this currently look like and where we see uh, the, the problem our motivation uh, for change so currently we have, for example, reporting receivers like the EA, like uh, conventions like the UN, uh, setting up specification, uh, giving out a call for reporting. Um, on the other side, we have data managers who respond typically to that by creating locally a data set which, which uh, fits the requirements or sometimes goes even beyond because they are often not just collecting data for uh, reporting purpose, also for national purpose, so maybe national purpose might be a little bit different. So here we have a first transformation stream, it goes to Inspire, we provide Inspire data set, so first instance I call it A1, so which goes to the data user, uh, potential data users in the European Commission, as, uh, also, but the reporting receivers don't reuse that at the moment. This is the moment, is the situation as it is uh, right now, so uh, and for to to fulfill the reporting obligations, uh, the data manager would have to transform the data again uh, into different instances. For example, A2 for the EA, which is conformant with the EA data specification, but not conformant with the Inspire data models. Might be another call for reporting, maybe from a convention, maybe from the UN, etc., etc., maybe from some regional uh, or national uh, instances. So they would be received. And here, uh, this 
one of the motivation we see where we actually talk about reusing Inspire for reporting is that we would like uh, to streamline those data flows as much as possible. So, and also to manage the expectation, they will, they will never be fully streamlined because the requirements from Inspire and the requirements from reporting are slightly different, but there is a degree of overlap and this is, this is the margin we can talk about. So, we are also talking about blueprints. So, here you saw that, or I mentioned earlier, that the EA is uh, managing a large quantity of such data flows. So, and each of those, uh, or most of them, are operational, so they're running on a on a daily base up to a six-year base, but basically uh, they are agreed, they are specified, and they are operational, they are uh, frequently repeating, and here this also means a change in running systems. So, and as we said yesterday, the one thing you normally don't do is touch running systems. Um, why? Because for each of those uh, changes we have a data modeling process, we have a requirements analyst process, we have developed support tools, we have developed new QC, QA procedures, distribution. Also, um, we, uh, we would use the, the blueprint for interoperability, for capacity. So here we think about those blueprints as some, as, as some methodology, uh, technologically, uh, which we can uh, extend to other areas. So this is the motivation of, uh, of that, what we will later will explain as a, as a linked approach. So here again is a slide uh, which I personally think is very important, that we talk about uh, what are the requirements, so uh, also our motivation. We would like to have an approach which is systematic and which we can use uh, to reproduce in different domains because there are many domains, many data flows. We are looking for an uh, approach which basically meets the minimum demand, extra demand on the provider side and also on our consumer side. So here, an uh, approach we can implement without putting too much extra burden on you because you already have to report, you already provide Inspire, and we would not ask you for something extra on top of Inspire, but we would like to ask you uh, for the minimum you have to provide there anyway. So, and we would like really to, would like to use Inspire, and we see a big chance that this is going to happen, to reduce the fragmentation, at least partly, in our data flows, because right now they are developing from the community uh, and there are, there's no horizontal interoperability between them. So here, if we talk about uh, reusing Inspire for reporting, also very important that we clarify where we at the EA at the moment, so everything is, can change over the time, but at the moment we see that the data models for us is reporting, having the reporting use case, the data models and the organizational infrastructure are the most important elements. Why the data models, it's clearly, it gives us uh, some conceptual framework, so they are very important and we would like to reuse them. Also where we see at the moment a big asset uh, in the member states is with the implementation of Inspire, where we already see that uh, organizational uh, structures are building up, capacity is building up, people's, uh, people from different domains, from different sectors are start talking with each other, so everything we see is going to be more connected and this is uh, an asset we really see and would like to reuse for, uh, for our reporting. What we not see as so much important is at the moment the web services, it's something, a discussion we had yesterday, this is something which we still have to explore and to discuss. Also the use of metadata for reporting is of minor importance. Um, also yesterday was already introduced shortly uh, data typology, so our reporting system builds on the separation of what we call type 1, which is geospatial reference data, which if I might abstract that or generalize that, uh, could be seen as the Inspire data specification, so those parts which can be covered and expected from Inspire. So those parts which are still data, so environmental data, but it's not part of the Inspire scope or Inspire data specification, we would, uh, we would call type 2 uh, and uh, handle separately. Also there's type 3, uh, contextual and textual data, which is not part of TTDA, so I'm not dealing with that right now. So we are just talking about type 1 and type 2. So here again, this is a picture. I said before uh, that reporting obligation uh, typically demands uh, a certain number of elements and Inspire is just part of that. Now I have a slight mismatch with You see the EEA and each environment. Um, something got wrong with the slides. Uh, and here you see a little bit this, um, the ratio between type 1 and type 2. So um, the actual, the, 
the percentage, the proportion of that of the difference of cost depends each time in the, in the individual data flow. But here, what I want to show you and want to make clear is that the inspired data specification, specification are just a little part of that what we normally require for our reporting. But still, it's an important part, and it's often the most complicated part because it uh, deals with the encoding of the spatial data. So we see three different uh, approaches uh, how we can deal with that, uh, with that overlap. So uh, the first of them is we call integration. And I will not go in detail too much of that. Integration uh, aims at creating a super, uh, super schema. And we have seen it in the air quality example, for example. Uh, the second one would be a, a simple uh, version of the integration. So here we have just one team, which we directly extend. We end up with one schema where we have everything in one data file. And then there is an approach where we think SEA is um, very pragmatic and uh, at least demanding for the, for the data providers. And that we call the linked approach. And this is what I will explain in a little bit more in detail. Linked approach builds on uh, separate handling of the Inspire resource and of the uh, uh, external data, so of the type 2 data. So this is what we will have in CDA and what we are currently testing. And what are the principles of that? So again, if we talk about a blueprint, the blueprint builds on some principles. So here again, uh, the, uh, the linked approach builds on that we builds on the assumption that we reuse Inspire as we can provide, as we can expect it from the member states. So um, we will, we made not so good experience with building extensions, despite this might be uh, might be a, another feasible approach, and there are there are cases like for uh, the EU registry where we still go there that way, but for CDDA we decided that we would fall back to what we can expect and minimum from the countries to provide us for our protected sites, and to manage uh, the rest, which is not which is still requested for the reporting, but not part of Inspire to have that as an external file, which we can handle as easy as possible. So in the case of CDDA, this is a flat XML file, which then points back to the Inspire resource, or to a Gmail file, which then basically is an instance of the, of the protected sites. So here we really think that we can uh, reuse very easily uh, those, uh, those resources provided by the member states for Inspire, and we not have to ask them to deploy another extension to have an extra resource uh, just for reporting. So that's very important, and this is the basic principle of the linked approach and our motivation why we do that. So how this looks in practice. Um, here we have an example for CDDA. So CDDA uh, is uh, the common designated areas uh, database. It is uh, containing protected sites from the member states, which typically, well not in every case, is uh, not containing a tour of the thousand, but goes beyond, so those which are national designated. So it's one of our IONET core data flows. It's a yearly reporting. And uh, I think it's now the 16th year we are collecting this data. And uh, it serves as a test case because it's not part of the environmental legislation. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a voluntary uh, data flow, and it's a rather simple data model. So in practice, it looks like that. So here we have a previous data model. I think it's from 2015. And uh, in, the, in the blue bubbles, you see that what we call type 1. So those are those elements which can be mapped towards Inspire. So those elements which we see, we could, in theory, uh, host with Inspire. In practice, then we decided, for example, to outsource the IOCN category for uh, some internal reasons. Um, but basically, those, uh, those are the elements where you see also a little bit of ratio between that what we call type 1 data and type 2 data. So uh, why we call it a new approach, but actually it's not so much new. So the changes of that, are, I think, are marginal. So, um, but still, the details contain uh, um, include some new formatting new data models uh, and the use of GML. So here you see the, um, the difference between uh, the, on the top, the, the CDDA data uh, reporting as we had it so far. So it contains a, uh, a shapefile typically and, uh, and tabular data, XML or MX Access database, and uh, they are pointing to each other. And in the future, in 2018, we would like to replace that um, by, again, a two-segment approach by the Inspire protected sites, which are deployed by the countries, so ESA, 
you create it, you just transform it for the purpose of CDDA, but then it becomes subject of Inspire, So, and this should be an Inspire already included by 2000, November 2017. So you might just use the Inspire service you already deploy, uh, take those data, and to complement this with the, with the right part, what we call tabular data, and here it is important that the tabular data points on the Inspire resource. Unfortunately, it doesn't work the other way around. It only works from the, from the environment data which points to the Inspire resource. And both at the moment has to be uh, reported uh, very traditional via upload to ReportNet. So in the future, we might test here uh, a web service harvesting approach, but there we are not there yet, so maybe next year, maybe in 2019. Uh, you see more elements which are included in the, in the data model. And uh, here again, this is a slide which shows you a little bit the different levels of linking because it's linked approach and links, to be honest, are also the most crucial element of that. So it's nothing new. We had, uh, we had segmented reporting and segmented reporting builds on the consistent linking. But here uh, it's, the, it's the 101 of this approach. Um, and we use two different uh, levels of links. So the first one is on a is on a data set level. So the type two data has to point to the type one data. So here to inspire a resource could be a file, it could be a web service. And on the second level, uh, we have on the on the feature level uh, links where we build the association between the different features on the one side of the environmental data and on the other side of the protected sites data. Two minutes left. Yes, perfect. Um, Yes, this is a UML model which we use, and this is just another representation where you see how we build these links. Uh, we have two parts. Um, this is one consistent data model, which we then have decided, uh, well, it's an extension. Uh, linking is also a part of extension because you have to build with data, I have to work with data models. So here the data model uh, is segmented into two different schemas um, which correspond to each other. So in the, in the type two schema, you see we have a linked data set where we already uh, prepared for WFS harvesting because we uh, intend to use CDDA as a, as a test case. You see those elements, uh, WFS dot query, WFS endpoint, and WFS version. So everything we would need uh, from you and information to actually point us to your WFS resource, but also a GML file for those who just report a file. And uh, on the lower side, you see that we had, as it is a plain, uh, yeah, one of the lessons we learned is if we use, if we go as simple as possible, we use plain XML, and plain XML doesn't contain any Gmail IDs anymore. So we had to introduce uh, artificial IDs in that, and we had to uh, use foreign keys here, uh, like for the protected sites, which point them back on the Inspire ID. So for us, the Inspire ID is the linking element. Yeah, so then I would conclude with the CDA roadmap. Just to give you a little bit um, the, the view where we are at the moment. So uh, CDDA is a process we were running for two years now. Uh, and our, yeah, our big milestone is March 2018, when we expect the countries to report. Currently, we publish the draft guidelines for reporting. And they are out for evaluation and consultation till end of next week. So if you are interested, having a look, please do so. Contact your contact us or contact your national CDDA reporter um, who can give you access. Uh, we already received some feedback, so which was very valuable for us, helped us improving that. And we hope by end of October we can get out with final reporting guidelines. In December we will have the official call for the data, and we hope to collect uh, the data till March of 2018. Yes, and that's it. Um, I work together at the EA with my domain colleague, Mette Lund. Together, uh, we were mainly responsible for designing this approach. And if you have any questions, please come to us. We're happy to answer. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. There might be questions about this uh, concept of linked information to inspire information. Yeah, there is one. Uh, thanks, Christian. Uh, just a technical question on the second last slide where you showed the, the way that you link, yeah, this one, where you, how you link between uh, the type two and the type one data. Um, 
in your experimentation, you only work, uh, let's say, on the data provision side, so on the member state side, or you also are looking at tools that can then actually do something with these links and display these links? Because I think it's an interesting way that, mm. you, I mean, you basically store the WFS query and, and so on. Yeah. Um, so uh, I was wondering if, if you're building any tools or are you aware of any tools that can actually deal and, and, and display that information or transverse that information? Yes, we, uh, well, we are aware of that. So we, of course, we also visualize those data. Um, the, the challenge of that is to visualize, if you say out of the reporting data flow as you, as you provide the data, one of the challenges, as we know, is to visualize the complex feature GML. There are tools developing uh, and they are, they are getting more, de more mature, but it's not mainstream yet. So this is the challenge. Uh, on the other side, the type two is a, is a flat XML table. So uh, it's with no nested elements. So this is rather easy to integrate in GIS tools. Um, the challenge I see really is on the, on the Inspire side. Um, if you flatten that model, because we, uh, for our data uh, provision, we, we assume a multiplicity of one. You can provide more, but that what the elements we need is, uh, are, are just one. Uh, you might, we might be able to flatten that, and then it's an easy representation in GIS clients. Good. Maybe just to, as a follow-up, when I look at the type 2, if I can see, well, there's no geometry in there. No. So basically, if, if for you, the type 2 is the actual data that you see, and the kind of type 1 is the auxiliary information that provides additional things, you need to somehow get the geometry of your protected sites uh, plus the, the, the basic information out of there in order to display together. I mean, in the end, you want to display the whole yes. thing together. In the end, no? easily we want to have a join on the Inspire ID, uh, that's what we want, uh, and the challenge we see is to integrate uh, the Inspire data in a GIS environment. Because the type 2, as we handle it right now, we want to have it as simple as possible for providers and for us. This means we would like to go for flat tables, uh, for, for flat XML. And this would not be a challenge for a GIS client, uh, but it's rather the complex feature uh, GML on the Inspire side. <coughs> At the moment, you don't like the answer. But <laughs> okay. Um, unfortunately, I have a question too, but you're you're first, <laughs> of course. Thank you, Elise Arvampa from Finnish Environment Institute. If you could put the, the slide where you're presenting the uh, reporting approach of CDDA, so a few Which one? slides. Just say stop. This uh no. This one. Okay, uh, if I think from the country perspective in these reporting obligations that where we already have the spatial data set, uh, this is the, the first option, the older one, older version is already producing a harmonized product. So now when we have this inspire data model use, so what are the benefits that yeah. we gained using well, Inspire right data model when we already have this yeah. harmonized data product. Um, uh, the motivation is uh, built on the assumption that you would implement Inspire and that you would have to provide uh, those data which you now uh, have harmonized for CDDA, the old approach, the shapefile, that you would need to provide this uh, under Inspire anyway. So um, the, ben the main benefit is that we would not ask you to operate two systems. So we would not ask you to provide the same data, one time formatted to Inspire, and at the other time differently formatted uh, for CDDA reporting. So this is the reason why we go to the to the lower level, where we would like to reuse that what you have to provide to Inspire anyway. So and without asking you for further changes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Um, I know this, but um, my question was related to the fact that what what does the Inspire uh, what kind of benefits we get from Inspire, do it in Inspire way, you know, if you understand. And what I mean. Not really. So if you ask what Inspire have ever done good for you, uh, is this the question uh, no, but that I would ask you to, you know, you are surrounded by GSC We colleagues. already have this harmonized data model and now yes. we have Inspire harmonized data model. So, you know, uh, is there any benefits from well, that? 
Yeah, the benefit is that you reuse this. You can reuse that Inspire harmonized data model. So Inspire protected sites is exactly the model we want to reuse here. Yep. So our mo well, we we assume you provide uh, you provide your data to CDDA if I understand your question correctly, and uh, we would not like to ask you for additional effort. So we would like to reuse that what you have to export. Okay. Okay. I unfortunately. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I have to uh, I have to stop the discussion now because okay. otherwise we will run completely out of time. Um, nonetheless, um, I, I just want to throw in uh, two thoughts, um, and uh, one is um, if you say never change a running system, that's a nice uh, phrase. But if we ask, but if we ask almost all member states for a lot of themes to change their systems to meet the requirements of INSPIRE. All member states have to do that. Why should the EEA be an exception of that rule? So why not think about how to do something to change your system to meet INSPIRE instead of standing back and saying, no, we don't want to change because it's a perfectly running system. I can say that for Germany too. Second thing, uh, everybody, and I mean really everybody, People in the, in the member states, as well as judges, as well as uh, owners who own the place where you have, for example, nature conservation, they want to know from the member state, they want to know what data they sent to uh, the EU. They want to know that, and they want to see that, and they want to have that. And if you split up, like we did in the past, this information, saying this is going that channel and this is going that channel. And don't follow this one channel theory that we have about INSPIRE. You will have a lot of difficulties in the member states uh, to meet this, um, this requirement of the people, especially those who own the places. I would just want to throw in that and not start another discussion because it would definitely take a lot of time to go on that. And thank you very much for waiting. Uh, sorry, Dean. Um, but uh, now it's the floor is yours. I hope you have already, yes, uh, used the time to uh, uh, take up your, um, your presentation. Approaches for supporting coverages and multi-dimensional multi arrays required by Annex 2 and 3 is your theme. Okay, so thank you. The floor is yours. And how much time do I have? I'm just you get your 15 minutes, okay. of course. Yes. Okay. okay. Is there uh, Christian Aden in the room? No, so you have your 15 minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, preceding speakers. Uh, so you know, we, we've heard about um, uh, sensor observation systems and then also some of the requirements uh, that are required uh, by the Environment Agency. I'm going to dive in uh, at a bit more of a technical talk, uh, focusing on how uh, tools that can help us um, exchange, the, model this data and exchange it and a little bit further to Michael Lutz's question about uh, how do we model some of these complex uh, um, GML models and, and integrate those into GIS. So uh, I'm not going to belabor too much. You guys probably know a lot more about coverages than I do. I'm relatively new, and so I'm sort of looking at uh, how our coverage is used in the context of Inspire and how can we uh, better support that. And so the number of workflows around reading transforming and uh, uh, applying those to different applications. Just a quick word about FME. Uh, basically, why are we interested in Inspire? It's because we do uh, data integration for, of spatial data, and uh, we see Inspire and European SDI as a, an important application of that. And I think uh, what we bring to the table is the ability to feed data, let's say if it's sensor data or remote uh, sensing data of many different types uh, into into coverages. And we also see ourselves as a bit of a bridge between open standards, open source, and uh, uh, various vendors out there. Uh, because the reality is all these uh, new workflows that are developing for Inspire still have to be integrated with the existing uh, applications that um, various agencies are using. So uh, some of the key raster formats, I mean, I've been, uh, you know, I've been to a few Inspire conferences before, and uh, even this one, I've been asking around for, for coverage data. So it maybe uh, uh, 
if you if you have some data you can give me afterwards uh, we're, we're interested in finding out what people are actually using and producing and making sure that we can support it uh, but to date most of the coverage data that we've come across has been more traditional raster data like geotiffs and uh, transmitted on uh, OGC web services like WMS and WCS um, now we see there's a lot of potential out there for uh, you know with with um, Copernicus with, with Sentinel, there's uh, uh, cloud-based uh, data sources, and so I think one of the keys is going to be how can we uh, integrate those into Inspire uh, workflows. And the other aspect is uh, complex data cubes like NetCDF, and uh, there's some challenges there because that, that can be, you know, those kind of multi-dimensional arrays uh, can be a little bit tough to integrate with traditional GIS tools. So here's what I would call sort of your traditional uh, data source, which is just a, um, a raster, a geotiff. This is a refugee camp near Dara in Syria. Uh, so the project I'm working on at, at, over at the OGC, some of the test bed data. And uh, so this comes from Sentinel-2 from August 24th. And uh, we have a new Sentinel-2 reader that allows us to um, directly go and collect data and, uh, um, and it, download that so it's it's uh, kind of a handy to I was pretty impressed with how current the data the quality of the data and um, how accessible it was easy to get at um, some I think with regard to the data integration that we support people tend to be familiar with what we do with CAD and GIS data and less so with raster so I just had a couple of quick slides which outline some of the, uh, the processing that we do uh, to support raster. I mean, we do all the basic raster functions like uh, tiling and mosaicing and clipping and reprojection. And, um, and then the, one of the key aspects is also being able to change the raster data model. Uh, in sometimes some formats have completely different bit, dip, sorry, bit depths and so being able to manipulate those uh, data models is pretty important. And when you get into analysis with things like uh, NetCDF, uh, uh, the, abil the ability to, to do raster algebra, so maybe take a, a time series and sum them, uh, that, that becomes fairly important. And ov one obvious application area is flood modeling, so being able to generate DEMs, flood them to a uh, see what happens if you flood to a certain level. And then we have a pretty, um, uh, uh, the, the reason why I'm bringing point clouds into this is because when we looked at GML coverages, the way that they're modeled under uh, the, uh, for, for Inspire applications and under O&M, it seemed like a natural fit to model those as, as point clouds because that basically all of the, um, uh, you know, the domain is just the point cloud X, Y, Z, and the, and the range being the uh, instrumentation values. Those can all be modeled as components. So we have a number of tools that allow you to work with point clouds, and uh, we're hoping that could be useful as well for uh, GML coverages. So this is probably review for you. It's been, like I said, an educational process for me to learn a bit more about uh, coverages and how they're used in Inspire. Um, like I said, it could be a regular or irregular grid, and so when you do have irregular grids, then uh, a point cloud makes more sense. Um, and basically, a coverage is just a, you know, for those of you new to it, it's basically just a surface uh, or a, a range of, um, sorry, a domain of, of locations, and then what are values measured at those locations. So that could be anything from elevation for a simple DEM, could be color for an orthophoto, or it could be uh, uh, temperature if you're taking uh, weather measurements. <coughs> and so, yeah, those are the main applications that we see: uh, imagery, elevation, and uh, models, outputs for time series, and interestingly, even risk. So it's not just a measurement, uh, perhaps of uh, like an in situ measurement or a remote sensing measurement, but uh, for example, in uh, the um, natural hazards um, that, you, that you can use, have a risk surface. So these are the five uh, main Inspire types, coverage by domain, function, grids, rectified grid, and referenceable grid. 
And I guess this is not a comprehensive list, but uh, if I missed an obvious one, uh, let me know. I think those are the ones I've come across so far. But I was interested to, to find uh, some of those data types under natural risk zones. So, um, so here's just a few examples of, of us working with um, uh, uh, multidimensional data sets. So this is just going from NetCDF to KML. Um, and uh, this, as a way of visualizing a net CDF. And so you can see this is a, a, a data set of agricultural emissions around the world for the last uh, 250 years. And I, I, I'm not picking, uh, I mean, I'm not choosing Canada or North America, that's where I'm from, but it's also, it's just easier to see the progression of emissions or agricultural land use development as you go over time, whereas in Europe, it's more constant. So, yeah, interesting to see. Basically, what's, what's happened here is I've just made geotiffs out of the net CDF and then wrapped them around Google Earth. So that's one approach, is to split up net CDF to geotiff for visualization. Um, in in discuss, the people I've talked to so far, and like I said, uh, somewhat early days, uh, looking at how to best support GML coverages, um, there does seem to be a range of extensions, or at least in the past there were, so hopefully that converges. Um, and I, I know talking with our development team, I was kind of hoping our support for coverages would be a bit further along, but there are a number of different ways of implementing our uh, coverages, so we, we really just need to see more actual data, and then when we have, have that, if I feed that back to development, they'll be able to sort of constrain the problem a bit more. So basically, a little more guidance from the, on the vendor side would be helpful. So here's an example of some I just went uh, surfing around, and this, this is a data set uh, from uh, Finland. Uh, um, it's like a, an O&M uh, uh, weather data set. And so the approach I took was just to use an FME workspace uh, to... I, basically brought across all the GML that I could, and then for the, uh, the coverage array that is not currently supported by FME, I read that and transformed that into a point cloud, and, uh, and then basically I sort of merged the two data sets. So uh, the, in this particular case, the location uh, of the sensors is, is read directly by FME, but then the, the, for the arrays, the range and, and uh, the domain set and the range set, that's modeled as a point cloud. And so you can see here, this is just the, the vector multipoint, and this is the point cloud. It doesn't look very fancy, but you can see all of the um, X, Y time, height, temperature, pressure, humidity, that's all in a point cloud. And the advantage there is that uh, in FME, at least, when we model it as a point cloud, it's a single feature, so we can handle billions of points, no problem. If you try to model it as individual points, billions of records, it's just going to, the lights will go out and it'll, everything will stop. You also can see the ranges of values here. You can see that I, as a check to make sure I actually read the sequence of, of sensors correctly, so you can see the uh, pressure is in a normal range or humidity, max humidity is 100, so the, the numbers seem to line up. So uh, just a quick word about uh, some of our support for web services and what we're looking at uh, enhancing that with. So obviously we support WMS, WFS, uh, Atom, and uh, various REST and web services. So uh, the, here, in it, we've had sort of an outstanding uh, request to support WCS. So for the, for the purposes of this presentation, I sort of did a quick and dirty WCS and uh, a nod to the British Geological Survey because they were kind enough to put up a, a demonstration WCS, which I essentially uh, copied and, and made a workspace out of. And so this just shows some of the flexibility when you're trying to tie uh, different web services together with FME. Um, this is just no coding, just out of the box. I basically um, made a workspace which uh, submits requests to that HTTP caller, and then if it's a GET uh, coverage request, it fetches the, the raster data for that layer. And that's the output uh, in FME. So, 
Um, obviously, that's one type of WCS, and uh, when, when we get into uh, queries for time series, that's going to, we'll, we'll have to enrich that. So I'll just skip through here. Uh, just a quick note that we do have, besides the desktop, we have server and cloud um, options. And often when you're dealing with uh, uh, multidimensional arrays, you may have very large data sets. So there are some advantages to maybe perhaps deploying that in the cloud. Um, it's, so in, in terms of our roadmap, we're looking at supporting, we already support NetCDF4. I think that's new this year. And the main thing that we're looking at adding is Hopefully, with some input from you, support like full support for Gmail coverages, not sort of the the hack that I did, and uh, um, and also support for WCS and a WCS uh, server as well. So there's just a nod to some of our partners, which you've some many of which are here to uh, this week, and uh, yeah, just to wrap up, and then I'll I'll spin up my uh, demo live while while I pause for questions. Uh, I guess the, it, the interesting thing about coverage, Inspire coverages uh, or coverages in the context of Inspire is just that it, it varies from the very simple. So you have uh, the ability just to use geotiffs for things like ortho or elevation to much more complex challenges around how do we share net CDF data and how do we uh, have the, that data flow from one model to another and, and submit that to, as part of the reporting requirements. And so I think the, um, it still seems to us that there's some debate about how widely adopted the GML coverage structure will, will be. But uh, to the extent that we can help uh, uh, with the data sharing, we, we're, we want to learn more. And I think ultimately in the context of climate change, it's going to be more and more important to, to allow data to be rapidly shared from one model to another. So if you have a forecast model that can tie into a flood model and impact model. Uh, right now, a lot of those models seem to be in silos, and it's not that easy to exchange data between them. And if they could be tied together with web services, we, th we think there's a lot of, uh, there's a win-win there where the benefits of Inspire will be uh, much more uh, clear uh, than just a reporting requirement. So uh, pause for, there's some of the resources on, online. Uh, for example, the, uh, the FME server playground has a Sentinel viewer. Two minutes. Okay. And so in, anybody can go in here and download Sentinel data, and you can just get a link. You don't need an FME license or anything. And the other thing I was just going to show is just that Google Earth demo. So if, if there's any uh, questions, I can spin this around and we can see what, what it looks like in Europe. Yeah, I can see that as, when, as development gets closer to today, then you can see the color changing. So just one way to visualize NetCDF data. And this was our, this is my, yeah, that's the point cloud stuff. So this is the uh, GML data. And then when I view it as point cloud, cloud statistics. Okay, well I think I've used up the time. So in, yeah, any questions? Thank you very much, first of all. <laughs> for especially the very impressive uh, vis visualization. Any questions about it? Yeah, Hugo was the first one. Hello, it's Hugo. Perhaps I should let Michael ask the first question because probably 
I would get the answer from, from that one, I don't know. I was just, you mentioned, uh, I mean, this is very exciting because it's the kind of data, as you pointed out in your example, that we will be using and confront with more and more. We have Angel from the, the Copernicus uh, Atmosphere Air Quality Service also here with us, and we know that these kind of uh, wrappers around, uh, GML wrappers around these kind of complex, massive volumes of data are very important. But you also referred them to uh, as part of reporting requirements, because obviously this data could be part of reporting requirements, or as we are considering more and more, is the use of Copernicus for very dynamic monitoring between reporting events, something like this. Now, if you would uh, have them to report, and now I'm linking back, uh, linking, that's actually nice, to the previous presentation of Christian, um, would that mean that then these highly efficient structures that you are working on would have to be translated or changed to these linked flat tables of uh -huh. XML? And what would that actually result in, in terms of volumes and efficiency? Uh, well, when, yeah, with the way we do the data modeling, we don't necessarily have to flatten it. I mean, when, I'm, when I was kind of reading the GML and then merging in the point cloud, I probably did some flattening as part of that, but it's not necessary. Uh, in, at least with the FME tools, we don't necessarily have to flatten the data. We can transmit it uh, in its sort of, you know, whether it's you're talking about JSON or XML, we can leave it in the nested structure. The challenge comes if you're trying to integrate that with GIS. So typical GIS applications, as was mentioned earlier, they are relational based. And so then typically what happens, uh, from my understanding of how they model Inspire, they have to have a series of of tables with, with uh, relationship classes that link them so that you can handle the one-to-many. Uh, but with, within, FM, within FME, we don't need to do that. We, I, we, can, we can keep the, the nested structures, we can have, handle the one-to-many. Um, but it does present challenges if you, um, like, you know, I, I would admit that for certain types of analysis, we have to unwrap it. Yeah. But with, one reason why I like the point cloud structure, for example, is uh, we, you can do um, additions or combinations of, of, let's say, sensor data within the point cloud structure without having to flatten it out into millions of records, for example. You can just leave the million points as one object. Um, so it really depends. I think, I think it's if, you, if, if you're going to work with traditional uh, GIS tools, then, then that, that does become a challenge. And I think that for the reporting requirements, um, that's something to, to consider, that not everybody's going to have access, to, perhaps, to tools that allow them to deal with these kind of nested structures. There is uh, Michael here. He has a question over there. Uh, thanks, Dean. Um, I can see uh, very well how how you can use FME to maybe consume uh, coverages and turn them into something else, combine them with other data and so on. What wasn't so clear to me, if and how you could also use it to produce your um, your coverages and your um, your coverage services, because I think in your list of services that you support, the WCS wasn't there. And, and one of my questions is really that um, we have for coverage is especially often very large data collections and that's why we basically came up with the, the guidelines also for the web coverage service saying look if you want to serve your terabytes of uh, climate data or whatever data that you have it might be uh, it's not a good idea to serve them as one file uh, it might be a good idea to serve them through a service where people can actually select the bounding box or the slicing and trimming that you can do with, the, with WCS. Is, is that anything that you're planning to support to in the future, or is, um, can you say a few words on that? Sure. Um, yeah, two, two things. One is on my roadmap slide, I did have a WCS uh, server template. The way we handle, uh, we don't really productize our, our OGC services. Basically, you, you can have a, a WCS or, or WFS workspace that you publish as a service, and so we have templates for that. Uh, so that's something we're looking at supporting in the coming year, for sure. Uh, and yeah, just being able to write, 
I mean, that's probably where the development work is happening right now. That's when we support um, the way we support reading and writing complex GML. Uh, we base everything on the application schema, so when we are able to read it, we'll be able to write it. It's kind of a, a seamless thing. So then it's just a matter of, of uh, making sure that we've tested all the themes and we've just make sure we, we, we have enough uh, variations to make sure that we're actually supporting what the user community needs. But uh, yeah, we will be able to support writing as well. Yeah, thank you very much, and sorry if I have to uh, look at the at the clock, uh, but we want, uh, of course, Miko Visa to have time enough to uh, give his presentation too. So sorry if I if I skip your question. Uh, maybe we can you can ask it directly. Thank you. So this uh, is Miko Visa uh, from the Finnish Meteorological Institute, and uh, he gives us a presentation about the usage of simple feature data model in the Finnish Meteorological Institute Inspire download service. Thank you. Said Maybe. Maybe, okay. <laughs> then I, I use the, the moment we have. I think coverage Coverage is a very, 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 very important and interesting field that we have to deal with uh, in the near future because I just want to remind you that there are some themes, for example, species distribution. They started with, uh, with single objects, uh, point objects or, or tiles or, um, or um, uh, analytical units uh, and the data are directly addressed to that. Um, but we were well aware that there is something like coverage in the near future, but we didn't know enough about that when we, when we, um, when we de did the data specification. So there might be some uh, adjustments necessary for, uh, for themes like that to add to the coverage uh, thing. So, mm. does anybody have a USB stick? Hmm. Yeah, I'm very sorry for that. So this would at least give us a moment. Um, Very good. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, good morning to you all. Uh, so, my name is Mikko Visam with the Finnish Met Institute, and I'm going to talk about uh, our web feature service and uh, basically the three GML data models that we provide via that service, and uh, with a slight focus on the simpler feature. Uh, and I guess I need to be quite quick so that we can get to the coffee break also. Uh, just a small introduction. Uh, in 2013 we opened basically most of our data uh, that we have the property rights to and uh, that's both near, near real-time and historical and climatological data. Uh, 
uh, there's still some more data sets to be open and uh, we are in the process of doing that in the next few years and uh, um, the data sets are they are quite way beyond the inspired data specification scope so we have uh, weather and marine observations uh, radiation observations by uh, an authority uh, road weather observations model data from six different weather and marine models uh, weather radar images and also climatological data uh, and the open data portal, it follows the INSPIRE requirements. So we have the metadata in ISO 19115. We have services, web feature, map service, and the catalog service. And uh, data models are uh, <coughs> the time series observations, grid series observations, and simple feature. Those are the GML-based. Uh, data models, then we have uh, also uh, some binary formats that they are providing. And the same portal is our open data and also our Inspire portal, so it's uh, the same endpoint for both of these services. And it's uh, based on uh, the simpler profile of VFS 2.0, uh, which is uh, again based on stored queries. So we have predefined data sets with possibility for additional parameters like selecting time and uh, location for that one and the server is it's in-house production it's part of the SmartMet server suite that's uh, currently uh, it's open source it's available on github so feel free to take a look at that uh, so data models we have observations and point forecast as GML and the same data is published in uh, three formats that's grid series observations, uh, sometimes called multi point coverage, and then there's the point time series observation, uh, also known as time value pair in some, some cases. And then uh, the latest one is simple feature. And then the grid data is provided in the appropriate binary format, for example, uh, GRIB for the weather models and uh, also NetCDF and uh, GeoTIFF, that's mainly for radar images. And the links to those are actually in the VFS answer that you get, so you can download them via that one. Uh, data models. The first one is the multipoint coverage, basically. Uh, in the domain set we have the points it's usually four dimensional like grid so it's a location height time height is not always there if it's surface stuff and then the range set range set contains the data for the locations defined here and range type defines what kind of weather parameter is it temperature humidity or whatever um, and here's a quick example I think we saw something similar just with Dean's <laughs> system uh, this only has three dimensions we have the uh, location and then there's the time that's uh, in Unix time format and then we have the corresponding uh, numbers here now that's uh, I think this is two meter temperature probably uh, the pros of this uh, multipoint coverage I think it's it's kind of quite compact efficient uh, the file size is small and it works for many data types uh, and the not so good properties are it's not very intuitive and there's no kind of natural XML structure that you can't uh, you can't handle it with XSLT and XPath and these kind of things really uh, the second model is the point time series observation, which is based on the uh, water ML2 uh, schema. And that's basically one VFS member contains a time series of one parameter and one location. Uh, and it looks like this. So basically you have the time, time and the value. So the stored queries are named time value pair because of this. And the 
good stuff about this is it's quite intuitive, it's easy to use and you can travel with XSLT and XPath through the data. But of course there's lots of repetition here and the file size is quite large also. So it's heavy, heavy for uh, DOM-based parsers. And of course uh, for some data it's not really applicable, for example lightning strikes because they are <coughs> in a different place, every one of them. Uh, then last but not least we have the simple feature, so that's basically just one member contains one time step, one parameter and one location. So this is maybe the easiest format to read and understand. So there's location, time, what parameter, two meter temperature and the actual value and they are all in one, one big list. So this one is, of course, it's quite intuitive, it's easy to use, and uh, there's also some applications that support this one. Mm. Of course, this file size will be huge if you take um, big data sets, and it's also heavy for parsers. Uh, here's a quick comparison uh, on, we have 138 observation stations with 11 weather parameters, uh, for uh, and 72 time steps, that's 12 hours. So simple feature, almost 82 megabytes, time series 52, multipoint coverage 1.8. So it's quite a big difference here. Of course, uh, compressed, then they are quite the same. But still, kind of very big difference here. Uh, since we opened in 2013, we, uh, first we had only uh, the grid series and point time series and the binary formats. And we added a simple feature in 2000, beginning of 2015, uh, because we needed, uh, we needed uh, that for actually serving VMS layers via GeoServer. So we can use that as an input actually. Uh, and that's nowadays uh, part of the official server uh, software and here we have the usage uh, I hope it's visible uh, the blue one is the simple feature that was added uh, yeah, around here uh, the orange is the grid series and uh, gray is the point time series so we can see that uh, still there's some usage in simple feature, but still the two other formats have kind of, they are still holding positions here. Uh, this is request per month to uh, every data set that we have combined. Uh, but maybe the next one gives a more better view. This is a normalized table of uh, requests to different data formats. Uh, it's normalized in the sense that we have taken lightnings out because lightnings are only actually available in the uh, grid and simple feature, but not, uh, uh, sorry, grid and point, but not in grid. So basically point time series observation is the one that's the most used and then grid series and simple feature as the th third one. Uh, this is for one month, uh, July, July this year. Uh, we have about 11,700 users currently and about 10 requests per second to our services. Uh, other experience is that uh, I think others have also noticed this. We have, there are standards, but there's still, still a gap between the data model and the client's capabilities especially when it comes to complex features. Uh, what we have experienced is that amateurs and freelance coders, they will like a more simple to use JSON API. But then again, the industry and the heavy users, they are quite okay to use standardized services and the other formats as well. Uh, Quite many, ex especially researchers, they expected some kind of user interface that load the data directly into Excel uh, instead of a machine-readable interface. And 
What we have noticed is that there's more professional interest than private so far to our services. And there's some quick conclusions. We, we did, so I didn't find any clear trends in the simple feature uses. They, have, they are at a steady level currently and two other formats they have kept up kept the positions and uh, especially within the heavy users. But we still believe that the simple feature is it's a good complement to the two other data formats, uh, especially when you want to use some of the shelf tools or so. And of course we have to acknowledge that the weather model and observation data is it, it is complex data, it's multidimensional, high volume and fast changing. So there are, of course, some limits on how much you can simplify it. Okay, one minute over. Sorry. <laughs> no, you are perfect. <clears throat> no, you are perfect uh, because you really had another four minutes. That gives us the chance. Uh, so please excuse if we take four minutes of of the break. But uh, I would uh, like to. Uh, answer or he would like to answer questions if you have any pressing questions. Michael yes. again. Thanks, very interesting presentation. I th what I really like is that basically you follow one of the uh, recommendations of the data on the web. Best practices of the W3C is that is to publish your data on the web in different formats. Because basically what we, I think one thing that we see is that basically that, as you say also different users and different user communities want different things. Yep. So I, I would be interested to see to hear from you how much of an overhead does that create for you to publish these uh, your data in the different formats? Is, is that a, a big effort for you or is it easy just one to add other things like JSON and, and so on possibly in the future? Um, I think adding simpler feature was uh, not a big task. Maybe a few weeks of work or so, because we already have data available on, on the SmartMet server, and it's just one more format, a couple of weeks probably. Then uh, JSON, I, I don't know. I really can't answer that. I don't know, for example, Geo JSON good enough. So I don't know. IT infrastructure, let's say, providing these different kinds of services, that add any considerable load or? No, not really, not that we are noticed. Is it automated, the, the setup? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. <coughs> okay, no other questions? So thank you again for giving the time and answering the questions. And thank you for listening and adding to this uh, session. And uh, have a nice coffee break. What do I have to press? <laughs>